Welcome into this episode of the Living Room Disciple Podcast. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Christy Hemphill and Catherine McNeil, who are currently writing a series of Bible studies for BioLogos, one of the leading groups thinking through the intersection of Christianity and science. So today, we're looking to discover the ways that science can actually form us to look more like Jesus. Christy and Catherine are both doing incredible work for the kingdom of God, and their wisdom and their love for Jesus is evident in this conversation. Christy Hemphill is a linguist living in southern Mexico and translating the Bible into minority languages, and she also creates curriculums and studies for BioLogos and moderates faith and science discussions on their online forum. Catherine McNeil is a writer, editor, speaker, and the author of three books, including her most recent, Fearing Bravely risking love for our neighbors, strangers, and enemies. So without further ado, let's jump into this episode of the Living Room Disciple Podcast, where discipleship finds a home. All right, I am thrilled to be joined today by Catherine and Christy. Catherine and Christy, thank you so much for being with me today. Um, So can you start out by telling us a little bit about who you are? Go first, Catherine. Okay, sure. I'm happy to. It's great to be here, Nick, and it's good to see you, Christy. Um, Well, my name is Catherine McNeil, and I'm an author and an editor, and um, I live in the Chicagoland area, and I think we're going to talk about some writing that I've been doing for BioLogos, which is a nonprofit organization that puts uh, conversations of faith and science together, and so I love to... uh, find useful ways to use my writing and editing skills. And so I'm excited, I'm excited to talk about that. I'm Christy Hemphill. I live in Southern Mexico where I um, work as a linguist. I support my husband and I, we work with a, um, a team that's translating the New Testament into four varieties of an indigenous language of Southern Mexico. And so that's my normal job. But then I also have um, do some writing on the side mm-hmm. and I've done some writing for BioLogos. Um, I got involved with them because I homeschooled my kids living out in the middle of nowhere, Mexico. And a um, long, long time ago, I was bugging people for um, some good science resources for homeschoolers and um, you know what it is, how it is. If you complain too much, you end up getting roped <laughs> into doing projects. So that's right. That began a long yeah. involvement with yeah. the organization. I love it. Be the and, um, solution and, to the and, prayers you pray, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Sometimes you have to be the solution you ask for. And I yeah, right. um, met Catherine back in college. We went to Wheaton yes. College together, and um, I've known her for a long time. And um, it, she wrote a book called All Shall Be Well that was sort of about contemplative practices and seeing God in the cycles and seasons of nature. And I um, interviewed her for BioLogos at one point, and, we, and they uh, ran an excerpt um, of her book on their website, and then Um, We had some writing projects, developing some small group materials for Bible studies that try to bring together some science issues and Bible study. And so I recruited Catherine to help me work on those. So we're back together again. That's right. Which is how it happened. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. And it sounds like we could do about three or four episodes from Bible translation to um, all the way up to writing, writing your books, Catherine. And um, yeah. But today we're gonna let's today we're gonna focus on yeah let's we're just gonna be here for the next three and a half hours. Hope yeah, you, read no your problem. Schedules. Yeah, um, today we're gonna focus on the intersection of science and faith because that's that's a lot of the work that BioLogos does. So can you tell us yeah. a little bit about BioLogos? Well, I'm gonna let Christy answer this one because I'm pretty new actually, and but she has a lot of experience. Yeah, BioLogos was started. Um, I think the website was started in 2009, but um, there is a man named Francis Collins, who is probably one of the most famous um, Christian scientists. Catherine Hayhoe, you know, gives him a run for his money in the climatology area. But um, he was the head of the Human Genome Project. He um, was the director of the National Institute of Health. And um, he wrote a book called The Language of God, which um, sort of examined some questions that scientists have when they come to faith. And he got a lot of um, emails and letters about that book. So he started a website to sort of have a place to continue conversation about 
um, some of these issues that people were trying to just bring harmony between what they knew from science and um, what they believed as Christians. And um, that organization that he started has um, been dedicated to equipping the church to engage with um, consensus science. There's sort of been a history in evangelicalism, at least, um, of sort of having an antagonistic approach that scientists are sort of um, in league with the devil to suppress hmm. the truth of the Bible and we can't trust them and they're out to deceive us and there's a yeah. vast global conspiracy to hide the truth. And um, so they've been trying to kind of have a different narrative that um, science can be a Christian vocation, that we need faithful Christians at the table um, when we're having these discussions that are impacting our world um, in the areas of like STEM and um AI and transhumanism mm -hmm. and all the DNA editing, all these things that we have kind of on our horizons. Um, we really need people with um, ethical grounding and um, just a, a desire to like love our neighbors well in those conversations. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what Biologos has been trying to do is, is provide resources and stimulate conversations around how do we, how do we bring people who are in the sciences um, uh, together with people who are studying theology, studying Bible interpretation, and um, how do we enrich each other? Yeah, I love that. And I think that work is so incredibly important. Um, can y'all touch on just a little bit why that work is important to you? Why, why do you think it's worth spending your time investing in this, this conversation? I, it is a topic that's really important to me. I'm not personally a scientist. I, I got involved in this because I do write Bible studies for a living. So that's how I yeah. came to be here. But I am a science enthusiast and I have a lot of uh, friends and relatives who are scientists. And um, I'm also a mom and I, I have kids who have been interested in science since they were in preschool. And I'm concerned about, I'm very personally concerned about the fact that so many Christians um, from childhood are kind of told you can you can pick God or you can pick science. And that's that's a lose. Like, why would we do that? You know what I mean? Like if you said, you know, um, you can have chocolate ice cream or you can have God. Like, why, though? You know, like there's yeah, no yeah. reason to make that false choice. But we have made it and we have mm -hmm. integrated that false choice into our understanding of faith so thoroughly that there are literally millions of people who think they have to choose between God and science. Right. But science is just the exploration of what God has made, you know, which of course yeah. we're never going to understand fully, but you know, who doesn't want to understand a little bit more about how creation, beautiful, stunning creation works, you know? Um, so I, th I just am so personally passionate uh, for us to take down this false choice and right. open the door for for people to engage with their curiosity, just fully, fully engage the wonder, the awe, which can lead mm. to worship, you know, which can lead to ways of serving our fellow humans. Um, why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's beautiful and so helpful, Christy. I, do you I have think it's to, to I add on? also got into the interest because I was homeschooling and I have um, a child who's very precocious in math and science and, you know, was reading encyclopedias with a flashlight under the covers when he was six. And yeah. um, he, I wanted to equip myself to teach him better. And that sort of like science is super interesting. So yeah. <laughs> that, that sort of opened up um, just some, avenues of exploration for myself. And um, when you look at the research that comes out of, you know, the Barna Group or the Fuller Youth Institute about why young people are walking away from their childhood beliefs in college, the, the failure of the church to have conversations about some of these scientific issues mm. and this conflict narrative that they've set up comes up a lot. And so I think that... Um, it, 
you know, I know your podcast is focused on discipleship, but I think it really is a discipleship issue when we're talking about how do we um, help our adolescents and college students, um, especially ones who have natural giftings in these science and technology areas, how Mm. do we help them integrate um, the truth that we can learn about creation through scientific study and the truth that we can learn about God through our um, Bible reading, our Christian experience, our service, our um, relationship with God. And just, I am passionate about this idea that there is a way to bring those together. Science Mm. doesn't, it's not the only um, way to find truth, but it does help us understand some things. Yeah. And same thing with the Bible. We don't go to the Bible for the answer to every question, but it does answer important questions. And so how do we bring all of our different ways of knowing to the questions yeah. that we have? Yeah. One thing that I tell I my that. kids is, and this obviously is not 100% true, but are accurate, applicable, but I'm I say now. that we, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I say we go to the Bible to find out how, and we go, no, we go to science to find out how, and we go to the Bible to find out why. Oh, interesting. I'm going to take notes on that. That's that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we like to talk about around here ways that we can be formed to be more like Jesus and ways that we can be formed to be less like Jesus. And so I want to touch on both of those aspects today, but but for both of you personally, how, how do you feel that science has actually allowed you to, to live more like Jesus? How has it allowed you to deepen your discipleship and your worship and your, your glory of God and, and the different aspects of your life that, that come with your faith? How has science actually benefited your faith? Hmm. Well, um, I think the, the idea of embodiment has kind of been a theme that a lot of people have been talking about and sort of trying to understand from a a Christian perspective. And I I feel like a lot of the areas of science that interest me, um, like the creation care and the um, like neuroscience, like how, what's the relationship between our, the spiritual dimension of our existence and our brains. Um, Like we live in, in bodies that are made up of chemicals that have biological processes and science really does help us understand um, things that help us like go out into the world and be healers and be um, people who work towards justice. And so I mean, where I live in Southern Mexico, climate change has definitely been affecting the, yeah. there's subsistence farmers that I work with. The rains are not coming when they're normally had. We've had two hurricanes this season already that have flooded things and caused landslides. And um, so the idea that in order for me to love my neighbors well and the people that I serve, I need to understand what science has to say about sustainability and about um, right. the changing world. This is this is part of being an informed like worker in the context I work in, and I, I think there's other people. You know, whether you work, um, what science can teach us about mental health or what science can teach us about. Even even things like how stress affects our ability to relate to God or something like mm. that. These are these are things that help us understand the bodies we live in, understand the world that our bodies inhabit, and um, we can bring our spiritual selves into that a- area of existence. Yeah, I think for me, um, my most recent book is about. Uh, it's called Fearing Bravely, Risking Love for Our Neighbors, Strangers, and Enemies. And it's uh, attempting to look and kind of investigate some of the fears that we have about each other, not the anxieties mm. that we have, like, you know, am I enough? I feel like most books about fear are kind of looking at those internalized fears. But how how are we afraid of our neighbors? How are we afraid of strangers? How are we turning people into our enemies? Jesus, you know, repeatedly and and uh, passionately talked about the need for us to love each other, even when it's costly or even when it's dangerous. Um, and so I, I think one of the things that I love about science is that it allows us, I think, to not hide in some of those fears. It allows us a curiosity to interrogate um, why, why do we view topics or people 
um, categories in a certain way and not need to feel um, enslaved to that or imprisoned by that, but to but to investigate and to say, uh, why do I see things this way? What are what is the data? What does the data say? And not necessarily again to do that without investigating it or interrogating, you know, who is telling me this? How do they stand to benefit from it? Those are always important questions. Um, but I do think that if we can become open to to research, to curiosity. Um, all of the areas that Christy mentioned, whether it's climate change or mental health care or or health care um, and, and just countless more, we have the opportunity to escape some of the confines of fear that we do create for ourselves and sometimes get trapped in and can find genuine ways to to better serve and love each other rather than be afraid of each other. Yeah, absolutely. And, and kind of speaking of that climate of fear, um, it's it's really no secret that the science and faith kind of battle really over the last couple hundred years, but dating all the way back to, you know, Galileo being brave enough to say that, that we're rotating around the sun, it's not rotating yeah. around us and being excommunicated from the church. Like this is, this is not a new phenomenon, right? Yeah. Um, and so what are some ways that you would say the kind of the debates and the the climate of fear around talking about science in the church? Um, what are some of the ways that that is actually malforming us, making us look less like Jesus as we engage in fear and defensiveness? Yeah, I was talking to um, another mother who homeschooled and she was just starting. And she said to me, I'm really scared about science because I feel like that's the devil's subject. And it, it just like hit me that this was her, I don't know where she absorbed that, but yeah. this idea that somehow it's not God's subject. Mm-hmm. And, right. and I, um, I think we fear that science is somehow of the world. And if we teach our kids science or if we listen to scientists that we are listening to the world, and it's somehow um, a place that's devoid of Christ or the the Christian message or the Christian truth or morality. And um, I mean, I don't think we should compartmentalize things, you know, super extremely like, you know, these non-overlapping magisterium where science can never speak to um, the things we believe and the things we believe can never speak to scientific practice. I don't think that's true. And, but, um, I, I do think that it's possible for us as Christians to bring our whole selves, our spirit indwelled Christ formed selves into scientific arenas and use our brains and our intelligence and our, our skills to do work that glorifies God in the scientific domain, the same as any other professional or vocational domain. And so um, I, I, I think we've created this false idea that the scientific community and the scientific domain is somehow um, anti-God or devoid of um, spiritual truth. And um, I think that's just maybe like a narrative we've believed, but it's not necessarily um, true. The, the scientists that I have met, even the ones who are atheists, do not hate Christians. <laughs> they, <laughs> they like Christians to be good at their job. And so if your faith is causing you to believe lies, you know, that might be an issue. But it's not your faith that's the problem. It's the um, ignorance you want to live in. So yeah. I, I think a lot of the fear somehow comes from this idea that scientists are enemies and science is sort of enemy territory. I think along those lines, too. The, it's like a feedback loop because then we bring that breakdown back into our study of the Bible. And again, I'm not actually a scientist. I am a Bible scholar. So that's why, you know, that's where I keep coming back to. But, you know, we are, we're so hung up on fighting about Genesis 1 and 2 that we have stopped paying any attention to what Genesis 1 and 2 is actually saying and doing. Absolutely. And it's, it's this stunning, stunning um, story that especially in contrast to the similar stories of the ancient world creation stories at the time tell this just remarkable life-changing world-altering 
idea that we are created intentionally and on purpose, not sort of as a side effect of some other experiment going on and not because some lazy God needed slaves to do his work, um, that we were created, formed by hand, that the creator got down (laughs) and knelt in the dirt and, and, you know, and formed us with hand and breathed breath of life into us. God's breath, like, that's stunning. That level of intentionality and creative generativeness and, and love and belovedness, that is that truth in Genesis 1 and 2 is was groundbreaking, was world altering. But we we're not spending any time soaking that in and absorbing that and letting that change who we are and letting it change how we see our neighbors and letting it change how we see creation and the animals and the crops and the oceans um, because we're so busy trying to prove that this definitely happened in this period of time. And, And so I grieve how much we have lost the ability to study the Bible because we go to the Bible and we just see like, how can I use this as a weapon against science? Mm. And that's, that's devastating. Like you were saying, it's going to the Bible for the how instead of the why And when you're reading that Genesis text for like how and when was the world created, you're not getting the why of like the calling to be image bearers and the invitation to be God's children and just all of that stuff that speaks to the meaning of our existence. Yes, exactly. Exactly. No doubt. Yeah, I think we can often bring our own questions to the text and totally miss the questions that they were trying to answer when they wrote it. Um, and, and so we, we lack a certain humility when we do that, um, making ourselves kind of the main characters and, and assuming that uh, obviously they were going to write to answer scientific questions that they couldn't <laughs> have possibly dreamed of, um, questions that, that weren't even close to the forefront of their minds. Um, and so we, we put ourselves there. But then in the next couple chapters, Genesis 1 and 2 you're, you're speaking of, um, we do get this this human calling. Um, God God says to to rule and subdue, to to care for the garden and the land mm-hmm. and, to, and the animals, um, to go and, and be fruitful and multiply. And all of this, if you think about it, carries a, a science can can speak to, to these domains a lot Absolutely. when we're talking about cultivating land and raising animals and even being fruitful and multiplying, right? Science has a lot to do with all of these things. Um, and so science, in a way, is, is a part of the human vocation. And so can you speak to, to that vocation a little bit? What do we miss when we, when we view science incorrectly? Well, Christy and I just wrote a really great Bible study about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, I think it kind of does go back to that why and that how. You know, I think if we are grounded in the why of why we're created, why we work, if it's in order to bring flourishing and and to continue this creative work that God has started and called us to join him in, then whether I'm earning money to keep my children alive or I'm contributing to the flourishing of my community as a doctor or a writer or a podcaster or whatever it is that I may be doing. If I have that why down, that's going to impact everything that I do. But I, I, I also am going to need that how from science, you know, I'm going to need to understand how can I do that more effectively? And it's science that can teach us what needs to be done in, a, in, in, in so many fields, it, it opens up the door and, and Christy will be able to speak to this better than I can, but it opens up the door for us to work in fields that allow for flourishing and, um, and for creation. Yeah. It, we, we wrote um, on the image of God and what it means to be image bearers in our modern scientific society. And we looked at some of the places where um science can kind of speak into our image bearing questions. So for example, um, we talk all about neurodiversity and what does it mean to be a truly inclusive body of Christ where we're not just ministering to people who are different, but we are serving with them and that they are part of our body that we need. And I think 
the the insights that science can give us into how different people with atypical um, brains or bodies um, function can help us understand better how to be like a really inclusive community that depends on each other and loves each other well. We talk about, well, what does the science around um, the genetics of race, where we are understanding that race as we understand it is really a social construct, it's not a genetic reality, how can that inform some of the conversations we're having about breaking down um, the barriers that are in our society around these social constructs about um, black, white, brown, indigenous, and and how how can we make sure that what we're saying in our churches is actually valid? <laughs> because that's important. That's important to I think um, our young people that are coming up and and listening to how we're handling hard questions, and it's important to the world that's watching to see how, um, like informed we are, it's important to be informed. And so we, we tackled some of these, um, kind of conversations that are, that are happening around how do we, um, bear God's image. And by that, we took it to mean like represent God and his purposes for creation and humanity well in the world. And, And how do we let the things that we're learning from science inform the ways that we are applying um, our, our understanding of what God wants from us to specific situations. Yeah, no doubt. You were gracious enough to allow me to read an early draft of, of your Bible study on the image of God, and, and it is fantastic. And I actually hope to have you all back when, when that is published, um, because that is a topic that I am very passionate about as well. And I, I think there's so much there. Um, and even going back to Catherine, what you said earlier about fearing bravely and, and learning to see other people that look and act and talk and mm-hmm. all these things differently than we do and learning to look at them and not fear the difference, but but acknowledge and respect the yeah. difference and love the difference, right? Um, mm-hmm. So I hope that that y'all will come back for that, that conversation in the future um, when I that is published, <laughs> but I love it. I love it. Um, but in the meantime, um, I think it's, yeah, so important to acknowledge that science has this the way of, of both we've talked, we've delved into the way that we can explore God's creation, um, that, that science is a way to look deeper at what God has created and try to understand it. Um, but I think science also allows for innovation that allows us to bring flourishing to whether it's people that are neuro neurodivergent or whether it's people that have medical issues or, or all sorts of issues that, um, maybe even clean drinking water for, for parts of the world. Um, that has been made possible by scientific innovation, right? Um, and so the way that that up and coming scientists in our churches um, might hear that science is wrong and, and might that might stop us from receiving some of these innovations, right? So what are some ways that we as the church can be discipling our, our young people and fostering a spirit of um, like I said, innovation for the flourishing of, of others. What are some ways that we can be encouraging that in our discipleship? I think one way is just to make our churches an inviting space for scientists. And um, I was at a Biologos conference and a woman was kind of giving a testimony and she just talked about how she felt like her life was so compartmentalized because when she was in her research lab, she felt like she had to hide her Christianity because she didn't want people to think that that was somehow compromising her science. But then when she was in her church, she had to felt like she had to hide the fact that she was a scientist yeah. because she felt that the people she went to church with would feel that her science compromised her Christianity. And so I think, um, Most of us go to churches with people who are involved in some sort of scientific endeavor, but they might not actually feel comfortable Mm. bringing their whole self to church because of this conflict narrative that we have promoted. And so I think um, raising our kids to appreciate scientists and be interested in what they are doing. And then just when people... It's the same as with anyone else in your life. Be curious about them yeah. and what interests them and what they do and give them the benefit of the doubt that they're um, they're not a terrible person <laughs> because they do it. <laughs> I think like, we would never assume if someone's a doctor that, well, I don't know, I, some doctors are bad, so you're probably one of the bad ones. No, you give them the benefit of the doubt. So 
Um, I think making our Christian communities a place where scientists feel like they're valued, that their voice is important, that their expertise matters, that um, they are invited to share about how they view their vocation as part of an expression of their faith. I think those are all ways we can um, kind of combat this idea that science is scary and real Christians don't get involved in it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but let's, let's kind of go after the elephant in the room. <laughs> if somebody's listening to this and thinking to themselves, but science and the Bible are at odds. They don't, we, you can't, yeah. you can't have both. If somebody is coming from, from that framework, um, or if somebody is thinking to themselves, well, Christians should be focused on the spiritual and science mm. is looking at, at the physical. What would you say to somebody that, that is listening to this conversation and thinking, <laughs> what are they talking about? Right. Yeah. Well, I would, to the second half of that question, I would say um, that that's actually a pretty significant and detrimental misunderstanding of Christianity mm. um, that the Bible, if, if we're, if we're talking about believing the Bible literally and, and, and putting a lot of importance on it, the Bible does not seem to have a focus on the spiritual. Um, sure. Again, it talks about uh, the creator as profoundly excited about the physical creation that he made and deeply invested in it to the degree that the creator took on a body and became part yeah. of creation in order to redeem creation through creation. You know, Jesus was born. Like he didn't come to earth on a lightning bolt or on <laughs> a cloud. He literally entered into his mother's womb and was born. And then that's the incarnation, you know, and it, it was this earthly, um, such so human experience. Um, and then he saved the world through death, you know, which is again, like such a creaturely experience. Um, and then the, the exciting, you know, plot twist at the end is that he was resurrected, not to like a floating disembodied spirit, but into a body. And that that's what we can expect after our mm -hmm. own deaths. Um, is is bodily existence with God. And so the idea that Christianity is focused on the spiritual, I think, is a is a deeply detrimental misunderstanding. While Jesus was here, he's said that we can take we can know that the kingdom of God is actually here in, in Jesus because he's causing lame people to walk and blind people to see um, that he's sending the wealthy away empty and feeding those who are hungry and poor. And it's all this focus on our physical bodies and our physical needs and our actual community brokenness, which um, it's, it's so physical and it, we just don't, we can't be separated. God's creation cannot be separated physical from spiritual. And we as individuals cannot be separated physical from spiritual. So absolutely, let's keep bringing the why that Christianity can can explore. But we have to also bring in the physical how that science is exploring. Yeah, yeah I think one preach. of the most just amazing theological thoughts I have ever thought is this idea that Jesus is God made human. He died as a human. He was resurrected in a human body. He ascended as a human. And he like rules creation as a human. Right. God never unincarnated. Mm -mm. So right. the incarnation was uh, emerging of God with creation. And I think mm -hmm. it, it puts so much value and intrinsic worth onto humanity the idea that God became human, God is the first fruits of the resurrection in the new creation as a human, and God intends to dwell again with us. Mm -hmm. That is the, the promise in Revelation that, that God will be present as part of his new creation. And, you know, that's not like pantheistic or mm -hmm. that's, that's Christian right. Orthodox yes. theology that God is the eschaton is the uniting of heaven and earth, the making of all things new, the fulfillment of all that was intended, but is not completed. 
And I think it's physical. Like if you read first Corinthians 15, it's physical bodies that we're going to be resurrected to. It's a physical creation that God is going to make new and that God is going to dwell with us in. And so um, I agree with everything Catherine said. And I think that (laughs) the, the issue for people who come to the Bible and see a huge conflict between um, faith and science. Usually it has to do with their ideas of what the Bible is and what it does. And I would say that the first place to start is not even just like trying to find Bible verses that support my position versus your position, but just thinking about how do we engage with scripture and what do we think it is? And I I think there's this idea that people who sort of accept the truths of science have explained away the Bible or have Mm. um, minimized the authority of scripture in some way. And having talked to many, many very faithful, passionately committed Christian scientists, I will tell you that's not true. They love the Bible. I love the Bible. Here I am. I live in rural Mexico. I have spent years in like a (laughs) mud hut with a tin roof because I really love the Bible. I work in Bible translation. I do not want to diminish it. I do not want to explain it away. I want to live in the truth that God communicates through it. But um, we do not Um, we do not go to the Bible to fact check it, to know that it should have authority. We encounter God. We know who God is. We are changed by Jesus Christ. The authority that Christ has is demonstrated to us by the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it's, it's that authority that speaks through his word that, challenges us and transforms us and meets us. And so I think um, sometimes we are approaching the text as if that's our God. And right. the text is a vehicle in, through which we encounter God. And so um, I would just challenge people who have spent much of their life Um, their idea of apologetics is sort of like fact checking the Bible and making mm-hmm. it be true to just think about, well, are there other ways to approach what the Bible is given to us to do? Right. And I think that there are, and that they really open up lots of new things. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. So let's go back to our hypothetical person that's pushing back and, and not agreeing that science and the Bible go together. But let's say you just convinced them. And so now they're like, well, I want to open my Bible again, but I don't really have the tools to read it correctly because all I've ever been given are these these ways of, you know, reading Genesis 1, looking for the age of the earth. Um, so what would you say are some basic starting points for cracking open the Bible and, and starting to read um, through the lens that God and the original authors would intend us to read it? Um, what what are some, some hermeneutical skills that, that we should start with? Well, I just say go to the Bible Project website. And just start with their basics. And, you know, if you want to read a book, like, um, listen to their overviews. I think that's one of the most amazing resources for taking, like, the very best of biblical scholarship and understanding of the ancient context in which the Bible was written and just all of the things that we don't have as part of our cultural context that would have been no-brainer type stuff to them they just really bring it out. And um, they're not going to try to convince you to believe in evolution or climate change. They're just going to talk about good exegesis. It's <laughs> not scary. And that's where I would start. Awesome. Uh, I definitely echo that. I love Bible Project. Um, but I also want to say, you know, find some good books, find some good websites, but find some good people. You know, don't yeah. do this by yourself. Read the Bible in community. Find some people who are trained in science and in good exegesis and hermeneutics to read the Bible with you and um, form a discussion group. You know, I think we get into trouble when we do too much uh on our own. We, yeah. we only hear our own thoughts reverberating. But if we mm. uh, could put together communities of people that were reading the Bible together and ideally, you know, find some people who maybe have the skills that you're looking for or who work in science or who work in theology and say, will you show me? Like, will you do this with me? Um, 
I love books. I do. I write books for a living, but I think sometimes we fall off the we fall off the the edge and forget that we are embodied in community too. And and this was always supposed to be a group project. Yes. Yes. And I always tell the college students that I talk to on the Biologos Forum that come in sort of their like faith crises when they've just kind of, it's dawned on them that maybe their way of approaching the Bible Mm. that they've been taught is not going to work. And they have a million questions and they feel like everything is just sort of falling apart and they want to read all the books. And I, I say, you know what, it's also important that you go to a worship service yeah. and that you go to a service project and that yeah. you hang out with people who are meeting God in their life and being transformed and just like put yourself where God is showing up because yeah. you need to be encountering God as he's changing you and teaching you. You cannot do this with your intellect alone. You cannot hmm. figure this yes. stuff out and have intellectual answers to all of your deepest questions about relating to the divine. You have to actually relate to God. And so, yeah, I I would second what Catherine is saying that um, when you, anytime you're, you're trying to examine a belief that you've had, that maybe you're, you're feeling it's not adequate for where you are right now. It can't be the only thing you also have Mm -hmm. to be um, doing the stuff that, brought you to the place that you are in the first place. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. One of the things that continually humbles me about the Bible, and this is actually something that I originally learned from the Bible project, um, Mm. was this idea of the fact that people didn't originally have Bibles. And I I mean, I guess I knew that, but, but never really thought about the fact that for the first 1500 years of church history and going back way further than that in Israelite history, Mm -hmm. the Bible was something that was read in community. You, you learned your Bible from hearing people read it over you. Um, and so there was no idea of this kind of private quiet time where you would learn your Bible. You had to be embodied with other people, um, in order to hear the Torah read aloud or in order to hear Romans declared to the the church at Rome for the first time, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and you couldn't do it separated from other people. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think that's so crucial. And I appreciate both of you bringing that up, that, that we need other people to understand scripture. Um, so was there anything that you feel like we missed or anything that you want to leave our listeners with when they approach the, these, these conversations about the Bible and faith and science? Um, what, would be some, what would be a closing, closing remark for you that you want to leave somebody with? I think I would just say, if you feel like you have questions or you're wondering about things, don't feel alone. There are lots and lots of people having very interesting conversations, asking hard questions, talking about things. There's lots of resources. Um, The biologos.org website has a common questions um, page that sort of directs you to a lot of different things. And they are the common questions that people sort of run up against when they're um, trying to think about how we put science and faith together. And um, there are lots of people on social media who can point you to um, very specific books or websites that address your particular interests. So don't feel that maybe if, if you're like, I don't personally know anyone that I can talk to about these things. Um, the internet is a big place. Get out there and find some Christians who are talking about them because I guarantee you there are lots of us out there and um, you won't be alone. I think what I want to say um, is that if you are someone who has been raised or taught this false choice that if science is real, then God doesn't exist, then these conversations are going to create a lot of anxiety and fear for you. And it's going to light your nervous system on fire. And it is going to be scary and it's going to be really hard. It's going to feel dangerous. And so I just want to validate that. Like if that is the false choice that you have been taught, you're going to, you're going to (laughs) need to uh, take a lot of deep breaths and um, don't be afraid to say, this is really scary. I, this feels dangerous because God is the most precious thing. Like we, none of Mm. us can afford to lose God. And so if that's what you're feeling, I just, I want to tell you, you don't have to be afraid. I want to encourage you to take a deep breath 
and breathe in God's spirit, that breath of life that God breathed into you um, before the dawn of time. And know that God is here, that God is right here, and that there is nothing that we can do or think or imagine that could ever take us outside of God's presence. Um, Just, you know, as Paul said, if I go up you know, neither height nor death, nor, you know, even science, you know, and as David said, you know, (laughs) if I go up to heavens, you're there. If I go to hell, you are there. If we go to science class, God is there. Mm -hmm. Um, God is not in this tiny little box. And if we start, if we move outside of it, like if our leash gets too long, we might lose God. God is here. Wherever Mm -hmm. you go, God is there with you. So be at peace. Don't be afraid. Um, Stand in awe and wonder at the creator. Take a deep breath. And let's see what we can find. Yeah, here we've been living on the edge of the slippery slope for like two decades. And here we are. We're still (laughs) Christians. We still (laughs) love Jesus. We love the Bible. It's not like, you know, it's the first step off the, you know, cliff into apostasy. Right. No doubt. Well, thank you for your pastoral heart in that. I thought, I think that was the the perfect way to end. Um, and I, I just appreciate you both, how you so clearly model your love for Jesus and your love mm-hmm. for scripture as you engage these questions and these conversations. So thank you for, for not only bringing your insights and your wisdom, but also for modeling that for us. Um, and I'm just grateful to have had this conversation and I'm really looking forward to our next conversation about the image of God. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, where can we stay in touch with you and find you both online? Well, you can find me at my website, which is katherinemcneil.com. But you have to spell Catherine right and you have to spell McNeil right. So (laughs) that's going to be a challenge. But I'm also at pretty much all social media at Catherine McNeil. And we will put the correct spelling in the show notes. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I quit Twitter, but I'm on threads now. It's CJ Hemphill 4. And I'm happy to discuss any of these topics anytime over there. And I also uh, moderate on the BioLogos Forum, which you can get to from the BioLogos.org website. And you can put any um, question you have or book you want to discuss. And it's just, it's it's discourse software. So it's a lot more conducive to having like longer, more in-depth conversations than like Facebook or threads or Twitter. So um, if you have um, deeper questions, I would encourage people to um, go there because it's just a better format for really digging into things. Yeah. And that's biologos.org, right? Yes. And there you there's a link on the website to the forum. Perfect. Love it. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope this was as much a blessing to our listeners as it was for me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Living Room Disciple Podcast. If you want to join in on this conversation, or if this episode left you with questions, be sure to log on to the BioLogos online forum or visit livingroomdisciple.com to contact us. You can also support our work by becoming a Patreon supporter so we can continue our journey towards Jesus together. As always, we want to thank Anissa Leib for producing the podcast, Eric Church for putting it out into the world, and Daniel Ramirez for composing the music on the Living Room Disciple podcast, where discipleship finds a home.